this whole nutty concept of quantitative easing. Hi, Suresh. Professor mentioned the stress me, I have a slightly different take. Um, I think that people, the smartest people, are realizing the concept of marketability applies not just to gold, but it applies as a concept. You know, so certain stocks are going to be uh, sort of go to the heavens, as it were and certain other stocks will go in exchange terms against those stocks to zero. So companies like Procter & Gamble or Johnson & Johnson, you know, consumer good companies that produce very marketable goods, toothpaste and all of this, that and the other, those things are going to carry on uh, going higher, much, much higher. But then when you have things like banking stocks and insurance stocks and all of these stocks, which are just fiat traded shares against companies that hold fiat claims, you know, those things relatively are going to go to zero. So slight difference. I honestly think, as uh, Professor mentioned it, that they, they, back in the 60s when this was all breaking out, sort of the two tiers, you dress it up, oh, this you have here, and the public market deals at that rate. The gold futures market defaulting, you know, will be dressed up as like something like the nickel market defaulting. You know, it's just a temporary thing, force majeure, you know. Gold is a commodity, just like nickel, and the market has defaulted. So what? Carry on. You know, I mean, it will be something like that. Who needs gold anyway? <laughs> but whether the people believe that or not, <laughs> whether the people believe that or not, is uh, is debatable. I don't think. I don't think they will straight away. Straight away. Um, but let's let's move on very quickly. Uh, what's the time? Okay. So this is um, this is how we're going to introduce the concept of this competition that's evolving now, um, and this is a very good um, side proof for the main thesis of interest of fiat interest rates being in a declining and permanently declining structure going forward. There's no, yes, you might have swings up occasionally, and we have had a swing up occasionally, but the structure for interest rates is well and truly down, okay, until you can get no lower than the, the spread on bonds, basically, the bid offer spread on bonds. So there's a quick uh, summary there of what's going on. You've got uh, treasury debt outstanding here from 2007. And this is a logarithmic scale here, take note of that. Um, you've got corporate debt, the green line here. You've got um, household debt, household debt including mortgages here. And total credit outstanding here, which is just the sum of all of these three. And here, the blue dotted line, you have the treasury um, asset the, whatever it's the tarp, uh, I've forgotten what the R stands for, but relief. <laughs> the relief. Treasury asset relief program. You've got the more the holdings of treasury bonds here and uh, mortgage mortgage debt here. And as you can see, remember this is a logarithmic scale, um, they're increasing increasing at quite a rate increasing at quite a rate. They're certainly increasing at a rate greater than total credit outstanding is increasing. Okay, so some people will say to me, if they don't see that QE is a problem in the first place, that, oh, there's lots of stuff to monetize here. They can carry on doing this. But can they? I don't think they can. And the reason why is this. If you look at the chart to the left here, 
we've got the maturity of treasury debt outstanding, the red line here, and the maturity of the assets in the TARP in the blue line here. Now when the program began, you can see that the maturity of the, uh, the assets in the TARP was significantly less than the maturity of the assets out of the Treasury bonds outstanding. So you're at about 55 versus 45. Now, to anyone with a bit of common sense, that would have posed a problem at some points because the bonds that you're holding in your top would have matured ahead of the bonds from the pool of which from which you were monetizing. So very quickly they announced something called what did they announce? Can anyone guess? Operation Twist. Okay. <laughs> Where they said, right, we realize that this is a problem. We need to get the maturity of the assets in the TARP to a much greater maturity than the, uh, asset, uh, than the Treasury bonds outstanding. And that's what they did. So they brought up the maturity of the TARP from 45 to its current um, 100 and something, say 110. How did they do that? They did that by selling their shorter maturity bonds and replacing that with longer maturity bonds. Uh, okay. <laughs> and you think, okay, so they've, they've, they've got themselves some, uh, they're being very smart here, aren't they? You know, they've extended the maturity of their tarp and, um, you know, so they're not going to have to face a problem for 110 <coughs> months now. Uh, they're not. They're going to have to face a problem a lot more, um, uh, a lot more quickly than that. So what's the problem that uh, they're going to face? Can anyone guess? Basically, they will need to uh, continue this program, but the only way that they continue this program without reducing the maturity of what's already held is to buy treasury bonds on the open market which have a maturity greater than that which is held in the, in the TARP to begin with. Okay, so you can only buy, they can only buy now, and I'm talking at the center of gravity here, not around it. You, they can only buy treasury bonds which have a maturity greater than 110 months. 10 years. More than 10 years. Mm. So let's split that then. Let's split Treasury debt outstanding by its maturity to see how much of the pool is, is relevant to the TARP at the moment. And if you look at that, you can see that the vast majority of Treasury bonds outstanding mature well before things well before that held well before that held in the tarp so that in fact there is only okay so the percentage of, of outstanding US debt at maturity greater than 113.28 months that's the exact maturity of the assets held in the tarp is $2.5 trillion, and that's only 27% of the total issue of Treasury debt. Ouch. Ouch. So if you look at it, if you look at it, how much are we um, monetizing, how much are we monetizing, or how much is Bernanke monetizing per month? He's, he's monetizing um, how much is he monetized? <laughs> 85 billion dollars. <laughs> yeah. The interest you collect, it's over 100. Ah, okay. All right. Well, let's say I've got 85 then. Okay, so he's basically only got two and a half years of ammunition left before a problem happens. Now, now my smart 
uh, friends from college who are in this game as well, who don't believe a word I say, um, have said yes, but they can issue, they can issue, just they can issue more debt. You see, longer maturity debt, you know, thirty-year debt. I said, oh, what? So, so that would be like sort of coming up with a stupid bridge over the Pacific or something, and, and justifying that with a huge bond issue. Yeah, you know. And what are what are we all seeing? Okay, we're seeing the most ridiculous things being promoted by governments at the moment. Okay, a railway line from London to Birmingham. Why do you need? Uh, sorry, an extra fast railway line from London to Birmingham at the cost of forty billion dollars pounds to save an extra fifteen minutes on the journey. You know that doesn't make any sense. Okay. How many millions is that per minute? I, I wouldn't want to calculate. I, I honestly wouldn't want to calculate. But the point is, okay, is that they are sitting there and they realise, I hope they realise, that there's going to be a problem. They've only got two and a half years of ammunition left before the maturity of everything that they hold in tar will start to move towards the maturity of everything else outstanding, basically. So you have to come up with crazy ideas in order to justify more debt basically. So you mentioned the US sub tarp and HS2 is in the UK. Does the UK have an even more serious problem? We'll get to the UK in a moment. Okay, so. <laughs> Can you just repeat the sentence you said that you said two and a half years until the maturity of tarp becomes... Uh, I'll send this to everyone. Don't okay. worry. I, it's actually a piece I'm reading that was only for my office up until now. Because they're my office. Um, I'll send this to everyone. When it, you don't need to take notes of what I'm, the numbers and digits and all of that. Uh, yeah, so, it, so basically the, the, the objective of the TARP is, doesn't uh, have, isn't congruent with reducing deficits. Because if you reduce deficits, <laughs> you're reducing the pool from which you can monetize more bonds, basically. And TARP promotes the concept of, of, of stupid ideas, sort of, you know, castles in the sky kind of thing, which everybody will find justification for, you know, because of propaganda or whatnot, just in order to increase the pool of assets that they can buy. But believe you me, they won't be able to increase the pool of assets that they wish to re-monetize at a rate quick enough basically. They won't be able to do it. What stops the Fed from doing what the Bank of Japan did? They start buying corporate bonds in the US. Oh, they can. Real estate. They can. They can. The only thing that will extend the maturity of, of well, first of all, the corporate bond market is, is, is not as big as, is it? The treasury bond market? Probably equal. I don't know. It's big enough. Big enough. Yeah. You see, you can't, I can't do an analysis of the maturity of corporate debt outstanding. You know, that's too opaque. You know, it's too difficult. Um, but they will start doing that. They'll start buying mortgage assets, a greater proportion. Those are the only things which have a maturity longer than 30 years, okay? So they're going to be doing all of this monetization, re-monetization. Re <coughs> what do you think is going to happen to the long-term rate of interest in this scenario? Is it going to go up? No, it's not. It's going to crash. It's going to halve, halve again, and then halve again, and halve again, and halve again, okay, in this scenario. It's not going to go from 1.5% to 3% to 6%, as everyone on the planet seems to think. And everybody seems to think that if rates do go to 6%, that's a justification for them to want to hold fiat. What are you, crooks? You know, are you, are you gangsters? You know, I mean, there, uh, there's not common thought process that, that's behind all of this. And people say the most silly things, like a higher rate of interest on fiat is what will solve the problems for savers. It won't. It will just delay it till a problem that was going to occur tomorrow will now occur next week, you know. What they're trying to do here is trying to distort time. And you can't distort time basically. 
So look forward to exceptionally low mortgage rates going forward. Don't fix your rates going forward would be a suggestion from me. Um, because the only reason that they want you to fix rates at the moment is to buy, is for the banks to earn fees because they're not earning, earning anything from, from anything else. Joe was asking about what the UK situation looks like. It looks a lot worse, actually. Uh, so this line... Why did you ask? Oh, yeah, I just enjoy paying. <laughs> this is the guilt maturity outstanding. This is the... What do we call it? The APF Asset Purchase Facility Maturity out, Outstanding. And this is the difference between the two. And you can see that it's already reached a peak, basically, and is heading lower. Now, the way that we're monetizing debt in the UK is different from the way that they're monetizing debt in America. They have got a continuous stream, a monthly stream. Whereas we just did a lump amount. And if we consider that we need to redo it again, then we'll redo it again. Um, but if you look at the same thing for the UK, you know, so the UK, so the bank's asset purchase facility maturity is um, 121, 121, no, sorry, 156 months. And the maturity of guilt's outstanding is um, 121 months. And the percentage of guilt's outstanding um, that will not cause the maturity of the APF to decrease, the median maturity to decrease, is a similar figure. It's about, it's about 27%, 28%. But the point about it is that these two countries have rigged a, a, a falling interest rate structure. The, the same applies for the euro as well, by the way. Um, they've rigged a falling interest rate structure, A, from the beginning of the 1980s, but what they've been doing with quantitative easing is just adding petrol onto the fire in terms of a falling interest rate structure. So Germany is in a good, maybe you support the policies followed by Germany? Um, what policies in particular? Of not having quantitative easing. No, I, I don't. I say, you sh I say they should all spend fiat whilst it has value. <laughs> Go for it. What do you think <laughs> Um, we, well, I, we don't have enough time for that, but um, there are ways to get past all of this, but it involves fiat being marginalized completely. How about other industries contributing, for example? It will involve industry, it will involve, it will involve, it will only involve people, industries that actually do things. So uh, relying more into other industries for productivity gains? That's well, w w retailers, retailers, chemical companies, engineering companies, you know, these kinds of companies will need to be involved in, the, in what needs to be done after this messes up, basically, or as this messes up, to have a system ready for when it collapses, basically. Uh, but we'll talk about that later. Um, so essentially, I've shown to you all, okay, that... And I hope I've convinced you that it's a falling interest rate structure that we've rigged into the falling fiat interest rate structure that we've rigged uh, across, across the world. And the problem arises if we go back to our gold chart, our gold lease rate and gold LIBOR chart, is that you might be able to bring the LIBOR rate down indefinitely, but you can't bring the gold lease rate down indefinitely. And what does that mean? If the rate of interest, fiat, inter fiat interest, is continuing to go lower, but the rate of, uh, but the gold lease rate is not declining at a greater rate, it means negative go negative GOFO, increasing backwardation, basically. 
So this is what you're going to see going forward. The backwardation can also be viewed not only from people willing to take, not willing to hold gold futures against gold, but also as a competition between the closest thing we have to a gold interest rate, which is the gold lease rate, and fiat interest rates, basically. A race to the bottom. Hmm. Thanks. We have a quick question on that. I appreciate the precise answer. What do you expect in the scenario you explain right now with respect to the uh, two and a half years and the price of gold to go towards assuming a fundamental valuation of using the option to be above? Oh, so it's difficult. I, mean, just I, do, I don't, give, I, I don't yeah. give price forecasts, sure. you know. And, uh, I just buy and sell and make profits or loss, you know. <laughs> but uh, I, think, I think Professor, I, my view is Professor's view is that you're going to get to High, not high four digits or something, you know, maybe, maybe, I don't know, whatever. But then the, the market will just close, basically. Yeah. It's, <laughs> it's not, there. it won't be there anymore. Now, what people view of that event is up to them. Depends about what their view on money is, you know, or not. Isn't it what the uh, government view on, on this as an event? And what well, the government for sure will just dress it up as an event, you know, like... A this, non-event. A non-event, like this, this spoon <laughs> over or something, you know. I mean, they won't, they won't say this is a major problem. Uh, I'd be very worried if they did, you know. Mm. <laughs> but they'll, they'll, they'll just dress it up as some kind of market default, like nickel defaulted in 2006, you know. So there are two ways to view this backwardation, two different ways. People pulling the gold out of the system and not being matched by the amount of gold that's in the system, and also as a competition between a, a legitimate rate of interest, uh, or a less legitimate rate of interest, and a more legitimate rate of interest. And the only reason that makes one more legitimate than the other is that one has a, a gold back, a gold basis to it, and the other doesn't. Is there any assurance that the legitimate rate of interest will win the c competition? Um, well, I think that market will just close as well, Professor, the gold lease market. So you're not going to be able to borrow gold. At so does this mean victory for the real rate of interest? Um, it would. It would, but, but it wouldn't be there. <laughs> We'd be back in the in the situation of, you know, the ma the man hoarding hoarding the inventory and shaving bits off, you know, mm. and and vice versa. Yeah. So that's uh, that's winning by default. Winning by the py pyrrhic victory. Mm. A pyrrhic victory. Okay. Like a pyrrhic victory. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> So there you have it, everyone. Um, we're going to have some problems within two and a half years, unless they change what the definition of a year is, somehow. Uh, wouldn't put it past them. Uh, <laughs> uh, and we can all see why, and it's quite simple to see why. You know, if you can bring the rate of fiat interest down, you will, because you can. And you can see, that, and you, you assume that it doesn't cause a problem. Peter demonstrated that a declining interest rate environment causes destruction of capital, causes mass bankruptcies, because whatever you undertook as an individual, someone else can undertake at a better, at a better basis. For the moment. For the moment. But then that individual is put in exactly the same position as the first individual when the rate falls again. Chris. Do you see any way out that is likely to actually happen and be accepted by society? Because you can come up with a theory whereby you can visualize a way out, but in reality, one would assume before I'm getting to here, Governments have to accept this and bring it in themselves. Governments won't accept what my solution is. Right. Which, yeah. So my question is, do you see a solution actually happening? The, what, what has been suggested in this, 
in, 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 in something that I've written is that um, it will, what is being described in that piece, what people will do, will happen anyway out of the ashes of fiat. It's just a case of doing it beforehand so that the system is ready to just carry on afterwards, basically. At the moment, no one has gold or silver in their pockets, or not many people do. There's no reason for them to have gold and silver in their pockets, because this this cup of this glass of this bottle of water is 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 quoted in fiat terms. You know, it costs two pounds or whatever. There's no reason for me to want to hold gold or silver. Now, if that is offered um, two pounds in fiat or one pound twenty equivalently if you pay in silver people the chap who might who would be buying this is in a win-win situation and he thinks the person selling the bottle for, for, for on that basis is an idiot you know why is he willing to accept silver at 120 equivalent when he could get two by selling it for fiat let the shopkeeper, let the person think the shopkeeper is an idiot. You know, that's the whole name of the game. Yeah. But the point is, though, that if you're encouraging people to do this, there's a reason for people to have gold and silver coin in their pockets. Yeah. Because they know they'll be able to, if they use those coins in payment, they're using them at an equivalent discount. So, so essentially, you'd have, uh, people would have to completely ignore things like legal tender laws? And... Well, exactly. You know, so that's why it's um, a problem, basically. And then reporting becomes uh, completely different. Well, reporting, you, you could actually do all of this and report it legitimately. This is how much tax I need to pay, blah, blah, blah. But the point is, though, that when there's no f gold price, when there's no exchange of fiat against gold, you can't do that. You know, how will you be able to... S to account for the profit and loss in state name of money terms. You, you won't be able to. But there will be the system there ready, people with gold and silver in their pockets, and shops ready to accept them, and it will all be there. Because the point is that will happen anyway when fiat collapses. So it's just a question of doing it before fiat collapses and just letting fiat collapse, basically. Reading. No, nobody's going to let fiat collapse. Governments won't let that happen. What they'll do is restructure debt. They'll wipe out debt, surely. They'll come along and say, you know, all those that are holding guilt, I'm sorry, but, you know, we're, we're, we're rebasing your, co your coupon. We're, we're, that's it. I mean, it's, it's happened before. Did it in Britain in 1932 or 1933. Mm. I, mean, I mean, why won't they just do that? It's, happened in it's not up to it's the government. It's not up to the government to determine the value of their fiat, though. They can't do anything about it. Ultimately, it will be us that determines the value of their fiat. How can they increase the value of their fiat? As people have said, increase the rate of interest? Well, Roosevelt took the, money, took the, the real money away and he imposed fiat. And, you know, people, are, people go, they have, have no choice. Oh, no, 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 I agree. What, we, no what we're going into... I, 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 yeah, I'm just a simple happen. person, you know. I can't figure out how everyone is going to think. You know, I can just imagine how I'm going to think. You know, and if, the United, if the UK government came and wanted my gold, uh, they'd basically be saying that they place gold of greater importance than their own, their own credit, basically, their fiat credit, which is, which, is, which is a bit contradictory. I'd actually be on the first plane to Delhi with my gold. <laughs> <laughs> What's the definition? <laughs> <laughs> Professor, there are several, several definitions of what deflation is. Some, some use the collapse of the total credit outstanding, and some use the numbers of the CPI, etc. What's the correct definition to define, or to yes, to define the moment where we are witnessing this uh, global process of deflation? A very <coughs> a good question, and uh, certainly there's a lot of confusion around the concept of deflation. So I cut through this maze by simply saying 
And I start with uh, inflation first. You know? An increasing inflation, which might end in hyperinflation, means the velocity of money is increasing. And hyperinflation means that it's increasing so that it's faster than any given fixed rate you can name. Ultimately, it will get faster. That's what hyperinflation is. Now, of course, it could also happen that the circulation of money is velocity of circulation of money is decreasing. And to my mind, that is deflation. It could have different forms. It could be partly because the collapse of debt. Uh, it could be because of uh, people withholding spending because they expect prices to go down when they can buy cheaper, so they are not spending their money today.